Yes. Hi, my little flavors. Welcome to another episode of the Motley Stew Show, where we take one of the bigger stories in news and politics from this week, try to step outside the echo chamber, and find out what the hell is really going on. Taking a break from the candidate lineup this week, let's actually dive into one of the topics that they're all talking about, the Iran nuclear deal. Here's a bit of backstory. Iran is the world's biggest sponsor of terrorism, and they openly hate the U.S., Israel, and anyone they think is connected to the so-called West. Yet for quite a few years now, they have been under crippling economic sanctions from a number of places. The U.S., member states of the European Union, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Canada, Australia, Norway, Switzerland, and others. That's right, Canada said, no syrup for you. So in an incredibly dangerous game of quid pro quo, the US and five other countries negotiated a deal with Iran to loosen those economic sanctions in return for the fact that they would promise not to build a nuclear bomb and blow everyone to hell. Now a report from the Brookings Institute actually surmised that Iran would never actually use a nuclear bomb on us or Israel. They would only have it as a deterrent, but that deterrent would allow them to funnel massive amounts of their money to terrorist groups like Hamas, Hezbollah and the Palestinian Jihad, and tell them to basically ratchet up their attacks both in frequency and in ferocity, knowing that Israel could not use a nuclear bomb against them without fear of a large-scale retaliation. So either way, it still sucks to let them get one. But there's a bit more to the deal than that, and you can read the full text of it in the link down below. But I'll save you the 137 pages and give you some of the details. Now, these negotiations have been going on for years, and they were referred to as the 3 plus 3 or the P5 plus 1 talks. And at one point, virtually every country had actually left the negotiating table, except for Secretary of State John Kerry, who was basically the point man during much of this process. It nearly fell apart a number of times, but President Obama was determined to leave a more stable Middle East as part of his lasting foreign policy legacy. Now, the existing sanctions on Iran covered their nuclear capabilities, missile technology, energy, shipping, transportation, and the entire financial sector. When they finally came to the table, their economy was in free fall. The sanctions had done their job. Now here are some of the basics of the deal. Iran must dramatically reduce its stock of uranium from 10,000 kilograms to only 300. They must ship spent fuel rods from nuclear fission reactors out of the country, lower their number of industrial centrifuges from 19,000 to just over 5,000, and open themselves up to inspections from the International Atomic Energy Agency, also known as the IAEA, which is run out of the UN in Vienna. Iran has long claimed that they weren't trying to build a bomb, that they actually wanted to just have nuclear power. So the deal allows for that. For the next 15 years, they can enrich uranium up to 3.67% purity, which is far below the 90% purity that you actually need for a weaponized bomb. Now, the inspections have been a huge sticking point in the media for exactly how those are going to get done. Opponents of the deal are saying that the IAEA agreed to let Iran actually inspect itself and then send its findings to them for verification. That sounds dumb as hell, right? Absolutely. And it would be if it were true. But as always, the truth is more complicated than you can fit in the headline. The Iranian-led inspections are actually in reference only to one site, located in a place called Parchin, which has been dormant for over a decade. This is an old military site that many people suspect Iran actually tested nuclear explosive technology with the help of a Russian scientist. But there's actually been footage on satellites showing many trucks going to and from and cleaning equipment going to and from this site for many years. So many in the field of nuclear weapons research say there's nothing there left to find anyway. At best, we would only go there and actually verify what we already know, that they were testing nuclear technology there. And at worst, we would go in and find nothing at all. That is the only site that the Iranians are going to get to inspect themselves, but they will be under IAEA supervision. Now, currently, we don't know what that supervision is because it's part of a side deal between the IAEA and Iran. It's not part of the actual agreement with the P-51 talks. Now, critics also point to that as being somehow nefarious, that the side deal is proof that there's something strange going on and that we're giving up too many things in this deal. But people who actually work on these deals and who have a history in this field say that these kind of side deals between the IAEA and the country they're investigating is not actually that uncommon, especially for locations that are not actually militarily important anymore and are really there just for egos and showboating. 
One expert refers to the Parchin argument as a red herring, while the IAEA Director General, Yukia Amano, responded with this, I am disturbed by statements suggesting that the IAEA has given responsibility for nuclear inspections to Iran. Such statements misrepresent the way in which we will undertake this important verification work. Also, it should be mentioned that the IAEA was actually created in response to the Atoms for Peace speech given in 1953 by President Eisenhower at the UN. And the US sits as a charter member of that group, so we should feel pretty secure in the fact that anything that fits with their guidelines pretty much fits with us. And lastly, it's really no surprise that any U.S. inspectors won't be able to go in and check out those locations because we broke off ties with Iran back in 1979 after the uprising. And most countries, including Iran, aren't really privy to giving out visas to countries they don't have ties to. Now, back to those centrifuges. You might be wondering how they're going to keep an eye on all the ones that were actually leaving there. Just over 5,000 centrifuges are not there for a chemistry project. Well, turns out it's easier than we thought because over 90% of those centrifuges are all going to be housed at one facility in a place called Natanz. There is another facility that's actually underground in a location called Fordo. Fordow? Fordow? But that will actually only have about 200, and those will not be allowed to enrich uranium at all. Now, the Israelis were particularly concerned about this location because of the fact it's so far underground that their missiles can't even damage it. Now, I also mentioned before that Iran is actually going to have to send out its spent fuel rods. It has one main location doing that in a place called Iraq, and it will be heavily monitored to make sure that those rods are disposed of properly. The reason for this is because spent fuel rods from a nuclear fission reactor is actually where plutonium comes from. It's extracted from those rods. Now, while researching this episode, I actually found out that you can make nuclear bombs using uranium or plutonium. And in fact, we've done both. The bomb we dropped on Hiroshima was uranium, while the bomb we dropped on Nagasaki was plutonium. So, now we've gone over the main points of the deal. Now you might be wondering what happens if we come across something in those inspections we don't like. It's called the Snapback Protocol. Now, upon finding any evidence that we don't like, a report is filed with the UN Security Council. Iran will actually now have 30 days to dispute that report or provide evidence proving it wrong, or all the sanctions will begin to pile right back on. For those who actually know the countries who make up the UN Security Council, you might be thinking, well, Russia and China sit there and they're not exactly fans of making Iran do anything that we want them to do. But the crafters of this negotiation actually thought of that already. In order to pass a resolution putting the sanctions back on Iran, you only need six votes, meaning Russia and China together can't stop it from happening. And then the veto power is actually reversed, meaning to take the sanctions off, you only need one country to veto and stop that from happening, and you can bet the US is going to have their hand on the buzzer. Alex, I'll take Security Council Smackdown for 1,000, please. Another often repeated talking point from the detractors of this deal is the 24-day inspection window, meaning that Iran actually has 24 days from the time that we notify them that we want to go into a location to actually let us in. Again, that sounds pretty stupid, right? I mean, I tell you I want to look in the box that's on your desk. You tell me to wait outside while for 24 days you burn the box, clean up all the ashes, go somewhere else, buy a new box, put it on the desk, and then open the door and ask me if everything's okay. Once again, the truth is far more complicated than that. The 24-day window only refers to non-military sites that aren't already included in the negotiation. Also, as reported by Vox Media, under a portion of the agreement called the Additional Protocol, it's actually 24 hours that Iran has to let the inspectors in. If they don't in those 24 hours, the 24-day window kicks into gear as a secondary effect, in which Iran has time to prove their case about why they wouldn't let us in. Now, it doesn't sound all that different from a 24-day window from the start, but it is in relations to how the sanctions snap back. But rendering this whole argument even more moot is that nuclear experts point out the fact that uranium has a nasty half-life of 4 billion years. So trying to get rid of it in 24 days if we were going somewhere that you were hiding it is impossible. Joe Sirincione from the Plowshares Fund puts it this way, The claims about the inspection regime are particularly ridiculous to anyone who knows anything about inspecting nuclear programs. If Iran were to flush the evidence down the toilet, they'd have a radioactive toilet. And if they were to rip out the toilet, they'd have a radioactive hole in the ground. They simply won't be able to cheat. Now the last point I want to cover here is the amount of relief Iran will get when the sanctions come off. Now that amount has been tossed around anywhere from $150 billion to $300 billion. 
which opponents say much of that will go directly to those terrorist groups that we mentioned before. But according to Jack Lew, the US Treasury Secretary, that number is actually closer to $50 billion, which is still not chump change. But Lou goes on to explain how Iran is in serious financial discord. They owe China $20 billion plus fees, and they have over $500 billion in domestic infrastructure and obligations. In order for Iran to get their economy kickstarted again, they're gonna need most of that sanctions relief going directly there. Anything that they can skim off the top to go to those terrorist groups is probably not gonna be enough to change the situation as it stands now. Supporters of the deal say this is the best deal that we could get, and it will keep Iran from becoming a nuclear power for at least the next 15 years. If we did nothing, Iran could have the bomb in nearly two or three. The borrowed time also allows for cooler heads to emerge and maybe the possibility of regime change. Jeffrey Lewis from the East Asia Non-Proliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies, holy shit that place needs an acronym, STAT, said the deal was excellent compared to where we stand now, which sounds good and terrible at the same time. So how does the deal actually get passed? Well, once it gets agreed upon in the UN, that kicks off a 90 day window in which our Congress gets to take a look at it and they can approve or disapprove. They will need two thirds of each chamber to vote no in order to send a negation of it back to president's desk, but he's already promised to veto that sending it back to Congress. Now they'll need three fourths of each chamber to do that in order to override that veto. People intensely watching the whip count now in both houses say that Obama might not even need to veto because they might not have the votes to send the disapproval in the first place. But if they do, they definitely don't have enough to override the veto. So this deal is very likely going to happen, but could be wrong. We shall see. So the question for this week is, what do you think about the Iran deal? Should we have waited for something better? Should we have just gone to war and tried to wipe out all the facilities altogether? Leave a comment down below and let me know what you think. Thanks again for watching another episode of The Motley Stew Show. If you haven't subscribed yet, this is the button that can do it. And I know with the subject that we've been talking about today, you might not want to hit a big red shiny button, but trust me, it'll be okay. You can also like, favorite, or share this video with anyone you think would want to join in the discussion. Stay tuned for next week, and as always, here's your little bit of Logan. <laughs> Good job. Hi, my little flavors. Welcome to another episode of the Motley Stew Show. I don't know why I always say other, like I skip the word other, like welcome to I don't know. The U.S. member states of the European Union said Union Union. They will need two.